So Haroja Shibe here, uh, expressing my thoughts about <laughs> the user activated soft fork or the activation of BIP148 as well as not sure what's going on with uh, this big cash hard fork. Now there's all indications as of <clears throat> the time of this recording. Hold on, let me put a pause and get the time. Uh, 9.27 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. There has been no detection of a fork. So uh, I was watching Ken Bozak. I'll put a link in the show notes. He had like a five hour live stream. Tried to keep up the whole time, couldn't. Tried to live stream myself, but I actually had to get up way early already before, you know, this was planned kind of like months in advance before this August 1st date was gonna happen where I was getting up way early in the morning. Had a bunch of shit I had to do, so. I listened to the background and kind of went through the whole process. Try to look at the treasure wallet. Apparently Kraken or somebody at maybe it's Bitfinex. No, I think Kraken's down, Bitfinex. There is an indication that there's one of those exchanges that there is BCH available for trading. But there's no there's no indication or propagation that the actual uh, you might want to call it blocks have gone through the ne network. In fact, if you check out, I think they've ended, but uh, World Crypto Network, which was trending on YouTube, by the way, YouTube Live, their um, Jamie Song and Tone Bay and the crew from World Crypto Network, uh, you know, they're, they did a live stream themselves. They were going through the whole process and they looked to see the propagation of the block that's supposed to be mine, which apparently, from all indications, like 1% of the hashing rate which is not even BTC's hashing power. BTC has a pretty significant hashing power as far as the Bitcoin goes. I think it's like 3%. So if they really were back in this coin, they could have put 3% the whole way. But anyways, one megabyte, which is necessary for them to activate the soft fork, hasn't even occurred. This is something that could take like, I guess all day, which is sad and weird at the same time. It makes you wonder whether or not how much of a smoker screen this is. The other aspect of this is that there's indications that the nodes, which were only 292, we discussed that in um, the Hard Fork episode, at least for the Shine podcast, that there was only 292 nodes, and that they're all basically AWS nodes or Amazon nodes, so they're not actually real nodes. They're might be signaling as nodes, but they're not actually processing nodes. So, all very fake. And, and don't get me wrong, there's an actual stance, if you will, or even a, a political thought, or even an economic thought to fork. Some people don't want SegWit, they don't trust the fact that the, the type of blocks that are happening with the whole. Um, we spoke about this, uh, I'm using the shy about the spin anything. Though on Litecoin, uh, which activated on SegWit, has the same features as Bitcoin, or what Bitcoin will have with the SegWit, with the spin anything option. And we talk about the million dollar bounty that no one's taken. But, you know, people are concerned about that. They're also concerned about the fact that it doesn't really fundamentally address the, uh, malleability issue there's also an indication that you don't necessarily need segwit to do the lightning network bitpay just put something out where they demonstrated that that was not necessary uh, that they were able to create and do microtransactions and do all the functions of lightning network without segwit they did it on a test network mind you but there's that but to get back to it, you know, people want uh, a higher block size. There, there's still a significant amount of people that want it, but they want it the upgrade to occur safely. Uh, I think people understand it has to be a hard fork. We already have an example of a mutually beneficial hard fork with the Ethereum Classic and ETC breaking off and working with each other to make sure that the break off was. Uh, beneficial to both as in the sense that there wasn't like you know 
repay tax, double spins. They both worked on the code to make sure that the split would occur and it'll be like basically pretty amicable. While many people thought that ETC would die off, it has not. Um, there are projects working on it. Uh, it does have it's had some issues, like, just like Ethereum. But because I think a lot of it, what they're doing is drilling down a lot of the development and growing it very slow, almost a conservative approach, you're not seeing massive contracts or monies or ICOs where you're having millions of dollars in these smart contracts, which was the problem with the Dow um, and ETC. You're seeing much smaller features, smaller amounts. Uh, and I think that's probably the best way to go with smart contracts. I don't remember who said it, but I forgot who said it about how you put in like a million dollars or even, what was the Dow, like $70 million in a smart contract was stupid. Why don't you try like five or 10 and see what happens there, see what the attack vectors are and fix it. Which I think is what ETC is doing. I think that's a lesson that Ethereum could be you know, kind of learning. We'll see if it, if it is with the recent hacks that are happening. Uh, we'll do an update on Ethereum. It's kind of a palette cleanser, if you will, with the, the whole Bitcoin block size debate. We only have one more episode, which I'll, I think I'm going to push out, put it out on Thursday. See how, basically how, if anything is going to occur, because pretty much a whole lot of nothing has occurred. I like got up. 3 a.m. at the wrong time, 4 a.m., no no hard fork, wasn't immediate, wasn't instantaneous, kind of like what it was somewhat with ETC and Ethereum when there was a break off, you could see indications, it was just um, kind of madness all day long. You can go ch check Twitters and forums about the fork and what they were doing. And not only that, but the developers were very transparent, very open. They, you know, back and forth, even if when people disagreed about the whole splitting, if there should be a split. Uh, we kind of talked about this, uh, or at least I talk about this with Andrew Vegetable um, from the Litecoin Association when, um, and it's still out there on F Society RRC podcast before the first episodes, where we talked about the Dow split, which occurred around this time last year. Whether or not, you know, what was done was a violation of the code whether or not it was an actual bug or just a, a function of the smart card jam. Um, and that's what it really came down to. And then there are those who were like, it doesn't matter if it was a bug or a function of the, the code, uh, the chain shouldn't have fixed it. They should, should have kept the mutability, accepted the loss, and moved on. This is kind of why there was a bit of a breakup with ETC. You have ETC now, which still exists, it's going strong. There's a, there's, again, like I stated earlier, there's a lot of development in that space. But getting back to the point, I mean, if somebody wanted to fork off, as in the case with Bitcoin Cash, they should have planned this months in advance. It seemed like Bitmain is something they wanted to do. Uh, ever since primarily the Hong Kong bargaining agreement, if you will, they've had a year to develop this code. There was indications of one of the developers who brought on who was already working on the possibility of the type of hard forks and upgrading uh, Bitcoin and was brought on to help develop the code. They could have hired, it's not like they don't have the funds, they could have easily hired uh, developers to work on it, test it, put it out there in the wild um, at the test net, get people looking at the code, trying to break it, trying to fix it, trying to work on it, making sure it works. Maybe eight megabytes might have been too high, maybe they have to start at two megabytes, four megabytes and go from there. But that's not what happened. It's just, it's just seemed to be very extremely rushed. Granted, Jeff Garzik, you know, he's been part of the community. He's done significant development for Bitcoin. Uh, just development in general for technology. But I just, I think he was overwhelmed. He was in over his head. Maybe a little bit of arrogance thinking that he could actually do this, make it work. Mind you, he is responsible for, I think it's Bitcoin XT. No, that my current is part of Bitcoin. It's first Bitcoin XT. I think Jeff Garzik is part of Bitcoin Classic. Yeah, I think it's Bitcoin Classic. So there's all of that. Um, I'm gonna get into what I think could potentially happen with BCH if it ever propagates itself about China and and the, the need for. Um, China as a country trying to put itself out there 
as a superpower. They've been making these power moves for the last 20 years. Really aggressively, I would say the last 13. Perhaps we'll go with 15 to make it like a nice sound number. So it's been making these power moves. A lot of it has to do with the declining power of America as a superpower, the rise of Russia. Uh, the fact that a lot of these southeastern countries, particularly like Vietnam, Malaysia, India, many of these countries are getting out of the shadow of the post-colonialism, are rising economically themselves. They're trying to uh, put their stake in the, uh, the global field, if you will, with trade. You know, Thailand, Philippines, to some extent. You know, the Philippines kind of wishy-washy in the last seven years. There seemed like there were going in a sound direction and then things just kind of, unfortunately, I think the global collapse went all to hell for them. But, where was I going with this thought? Okay, so. So, there was indications earlier this year that China was signaling that they want their own cryptocurrency. And this could potentially be a way for them to do that. Uh, a number of the companies that are backing this are not only based in China, they are Chinese companies, you know, the exchanges, the payment processors, the developers, the mining equipment, Bitnain, you know, big ASIC miners. Uh, China also, you know, they did that huge crackdown on the various exchanges. They did a little crackdown, a little bit, people forgot about a few months before that about the miners going after some miners with the way they were uh, taking up electricity within the, their country. So I think it looks like they were trying to perhaps not only get a wrangle on cryptocurrency and regulating it, uh, they also had a few Ponzi schemes that popped and kind of looked bad internally and externally for the country. But they could be, there could be some kind of power move or power play where China can have their own cryptocurrency and we'll discuss that why they might not want to use Bitcoin in itself the original Bitcoin and want to use a Chinese Bitcoin a Chinese control to kind Chinese own a Chinese version of Bitcoin so that's pretty much it you know this is you know happy forking day if you will nothing's happened thus far it could all change within minutes within hours of this recording and uploading but for now, it looks like nothing, you know, and again, just kind of, I kind of got lost on the point here, but, you know, people wanted the larger block size, wanted to be able to do things on chain. Those are valid things, valid points, things that people really wanted, but that's not what's happening. And unfortunately, you know, we're at the state that we were at right now. In the community. So that's it for now. To the moon.